Hello and welcome everyone. I am Chris Hyams, CEO of Indeed, and welcome to the next episode of Here to Help. This is our look at how Indeed has been navigating the global impact of COVID-19. Today is May 3rd. We're on day 426 of global work from home. At Indeed, our mission is to help people get jobs, and this is what keeps us up at night and what gets us out of bed in the morning. We have five core values at Indeed, uh, the fundamental ideas that guide us on that mission, and they represent what we believe, and they help us make challenging decisions about our products and about our business. And today we'll be talking about one of those core values, inclusion and belonging, and how we can all help encourage greater neurodiversity in the workplace. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Peter McKenna, Head of Enterprise Data and Analytics for Indeed. Peter is based in Dublin, Ireland, and has both a professional and deeply personal interest and passion for helping people understand neurodiversity and how to create environments where neurodiverse individuals can thrive. Peter, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks very much. I'm really excited to get the opportunity to talk about something, as you say, that I, I hold so dearly. Well, let's start off with the question that we always open these conversations with. How are you doing right now? Well, for most first and foremost, uh, excited by this opportunity. Um, in this crazy world that we're in, I guess, uh, things are getting better. I'm in Ireland. Uh, we've we're in our third lockdown. Unfortunately, we're in the fourth or fifth month of our third lockdown, beginning to ease. Uh, and I guess the, the one positive I would take from it, I'm very, very lucky. Nobody close to me has had serious problems from it. Uh, I have enormous sympathy for those who've suffered, uh, both, I guess, economically as well as obviously uh, in terms of health. For me, the experience has been I have more time at home, more time uh, with family. I think my family are pretty much ready for me to go back to the office now. Um, and then the other thing that I've, I've found really interesting is instead of going out for meals or otherwise doing the typical socializing, I've gone for walks with friends and actually beyond that social conversation had very real conversations. And uh, that's been a, a good step forward. Hopefully that'll continue when we get back to this normal that we're all craving. How about you? Uh, we're actually doing quite well here. I've had a similar situation. I've been able to spend a lot more time with my family, my wife and my uh, two adult daughters who are 23 and 25. Um, certainly a lot more time in the last 14 months than in, in the last several years before then. We're getting ready for them actually to move back to New York and Los Angeles where they were. So uh, just trying to enjoy these last couple of weeks and months together. Um, thank you for asking. Uh, so we have a lot to cover today, but let's let's start by defining a, a term, neurodiversity. We're going to talk quite a bit about that, and I think it's something that probably is a term many people had never even heard before the last maybe couple of years, and maybe some people have heard it but are not quite sure what it means. Can you help people understand a little bit the meaning of the word neurodiversity? Yeah, well, I, I can certainly try. It's, um, it means different things to different people sometimes, but in general... It's a term used to describe variations in people's characteristics, whether it's um, learning, attention, sociability, even mood, other personal factors. Historically, these characteristics have actually led to people being marginalized or even kept separated from society in general. As you say, in the last few years, I think we've seen a significant ramping up of societies, at least parts of society's openness to engaging. Um, but there are still, there's still perceived barriers and perceived challenges from neurodiversity that, for example, as we'll talk about today, employers uh, may feel in terms of being potential hires. And I think what I, what I have seen, as we'll talk about, I have uh, a son with, with autism, so that's part of the neurodiverse community, I hope today to bring some education or some information that will help to remove some of those barriers and how to, to include. The other thing I would say, if you don't mind, Chris, is I hope any members of the neurodiverse community listening will forgive me if I don't describe themselves or their loved ones accurately today. Neurodiversity, it's a kaleidoscope. Sometimes it's talked about a spectrum. It's a full kaleidoscope. There's so many different personality types, etc., cetera. Um, and so, while we talk about these things, and there's some great 
information we can share. Uh, it's very difficult to put an absolute definition on on some of the uh, characteristics. Thank you. That's a that's a helpful framework for I think the, the rest of the conversation. And um, just to give a little background before we dive into the particular discussion of, of neurodiversity. Um, Let's just talk a little about your background and your experience. So, so you're a senior manager here at Indeed in enterprise data and analytics. Can you just talk a little bit about your role? Yes. Yeah, so um, this role I'm uh, equally passionate about uh, because I, I love working with data. And basically what my teams do is work with teams across the business to create data-driven capability that uh, empowers decision-making, and uh, ultimately helps us to be more effective and give a better experience for, for our customers, job seekers and employers. Uh, some examples of that are uh, one part of my team has built a, a platform called Athena, which is basically a data platform that powers all that. And we can use it in many different ways. Indeed, like so many businesses, has huge amounts of data. So how do we get to the insights and the intelligence? And that's part of my team's job. Building on that, we create anything from what you might call these days the basic reporting, but critically important, how are we doing, all the way through to the what should we be doing for us, for our clients, etc., where we have machine learning models that uh, basically, for example, we help our sales reps and CS reps to understand who are the clients who maybe have something we should talk to them about today whether that is there's something not going well or there's a product they may not be aware of that we should that we can help them with. Using a thing called explainable AI, and don't worry, I won't go into really uh, loads of boring detail about it, but explainable AI is very exciting because instead of saying who to call, we now are able to say why to call. So the connections with our clients become personalized and therefore it's a much better experience rather than say, sometimes you get lots of calls from companies just bombarding you with information, whereas this, we're moving towards being able to be very personalized. And that leads to a better experience for employers, for job seekers, and a better performance for Indeed. So in, in your experience um, in, in leadership, you've had the opportunity to manage large groups of people, which um, increasingly means diverse groups of people. And how has your approach to leadership evolved through that experience? Well, I suppose the first thing I did was make lots of mistakes as I moved from being a, um, a doer to a manager and taking credit for other people's doings. I made a couple of mistakes, that I, well, a number of mistakes, but I'll highlight a couple. Um, and I think they are relevant to the neurodiverse uh, story that we'll be telling. One is the very first mistake I made, was, or at least I realized I was making was the, my first hires were all like me. I created my own little echo chamber and initially that was great. We all agreed with each other. We felt we were doing the right thing, etc., etc. But we were missing what we weren't thinking of. And so as the team grew, I won't even take credit that I over, I, I realized this too quickly. As the team grew and we needed to hire more people, new personalities came in and they had very different ways of doing things. The second thing that I would highlight is that I kept, initially, I would tell people exactly what they needed to do and how they needed to do it. I was very directive, very prescriptive. And the problem with that, I, I began to realize was, of course, I was just getting what I asked. At best, I was getting what I thought I was asking for. Sometimes I got what I actually asked for, which wasn't even what I was looking for. So one one thing that I saw where that really came home to me was we were working on a segmentation project. We were working on which who are our customers, how can we best service them? And my view, the my my view was quite narrow. It was like, okay, let's maybe use revenue, something like that. But as I brought other people into the team, we took different questions and we came up with a much more colorful, real view of our customers. And uh, I particularly remember a guy called David, who I initially constrained. I had expectations. This is, in quotes, all David could do. Actually, what he did was so much better than I could ever have conceived of. So that was a huge, huge learning. And that led me to realize that the best thing I could do as a manager is hire people smarter than, than me and listen to them. 
Uh, and the reason I think that's so relevant to uh, the story of neurodiversity is that I know I certainly don't didn't immediately think, oh, there's talents here that I should be able to harness. There's thinking here that could be different and good different and create new value. And that's something that I've seen a lot and we'll talk about hopefully over the next uh, little while. But it was very interesting to see how much managing people is really the same challenges, the same things to watch out for when managing people with neurodiversity. So let's dive in a little bit to your personal experience. You you mentioned your son. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the story of your son, Christopher, and how that impacted your view of neurodiversity? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, just a little bit of background about Christopher. So he was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. Um, and really, it was, a, it was a devastating diagnosis for us. Uh, many times people talk about it literally is followed by a, a period of mourning. One thing I hope in telling this story will be clear is it doesn't need to be. But even some of the professionals involved told us to have no expectations, etc. And that's taken me a long time to um, to move move away from those kind of lowered expectations. And in brief, Christopher was the very lucky because he was diagnosed at two, we got early intervention for him. So he went to a school that was able to help him. He had a, a number of years of one-to-one -one teaching. Interestingly, in that time, the teachers at that school had very constrained views on him. He wouldn't be able to write. He wouldn't be able to do certain things because they had a way of doing it. It was very directive, as I talked about. So we actually moved schools. And within six weeks of moving school, he was reading and writing. It was just given the opportunity, given a different approach. And that really, back to my conversation about my management style, certainly opened some eyes. And I, I kind of went, well, that, that some of the, the managerial mistakes I've made were, were becoming clearer as I saw the human side in a way I hadn't seen before. Um, to bring it up to present, Christopher was doing really well. Uh, he, you know, we talk about what is autism. Christopher is one person uh, with autism and it's uh, he's now so engaged, so socially involved with friends, with family, etc. Um, when friends, when some friends heard, as I said, there was there was kind of mourning, there was huge sympathy about the diagnosis. Some friends thought, oh, so you'll be able to go to Las Vegas, like in that in the movie Rain Man, Make, make loads of money every time you bring Christopher because you'll have that personality. And no, that, that's not that's not my experience. Um, but the it it's fantastic to see. I'm really proud to be able to say that he's doing really well. And it's, uh, for me, obviously, as you can probably see, such a relief. And so it, the horizons for Christopher's future and therefore my family's future is so much greater than we were initially told to be. And I hope the parents... And I'm conscious indeed of is a, a young uh, employee base and we'll have people who will face into some of these challenges in the future. It's not as negative as you may be told. There's a, a wide variety of, of outcomes and opportunities ahead. So it might be helpful to talk a little bit more uh, about autism, which is, you know, as you said, very easily understood from someone saw a movie once or maybe met one person. Um, how can you help people better understand the spectrum of autism? Hmm. So the first thing I would say about autism is that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. It is, people are that different. Um, when, and Chris, I'll, I'll talk about Christopher's school, Christopher's, the classmates that he has. Um, some can be very, uh, can have difficulty socializing. Uh, some may have difficult challenges in terms of their ability to their sensory processing, things that we would not necessarily, I'd say that say, things that neurotypical people, I hate using these scientific definitions, but, uh, neurotypical people wouldn't really understand. And so, um, but it's a kind of a physical need in some case that some people with autism might have in order to express themselves and to let out 
some of their uh, some of their instincts, and that can be seen as social challenge. What what I would say is there are just as many um, people, or sorry, children with other challenges, whether they have autism or neuro, or other forms of neurodiversity. Uh, and what I hope that people will see, and begin to see, is the ability and not the disability. Because we sometimes talk about what can't be done. Uh, and actually, while autism has a breadth of challenges, and I'm trying not to overdefine it because of that, because it's so wide, um, it's also important to highlight that the capabilities that, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about Christopher's capabilities, but spending so much time in the community and so much time with his friends, there's lots of, uh, lots of very, lots of capabilities that each have. And it's uh, fascinating to see how they're expressed as they're given the opportunities. I think you've already given uh, a couple of examples of this, but can you talk a little bit more about how Christopher's diagnosis changed you as a person? Yeah, I think, I think I'd probably say the first thing it did is it made me a nicer person. And I mean that in the sense that I became much more aware of the challenges facing people who were in any sense marginalized. And I, I will have to admit, I wasn't as aware as I should have been. And I guess human nature is such that until it affects you, you're just not that aware. So I would say I became much more hopefully aware of that, hopefully um uh, not just sensitive to it, but proactive in terms of of supporting multiple scenarios. But selfishly, of course, what I really did was I became active in autism, advocacy, awareness and services. And there aren't great services. Even today, I'll, I'll use the present tense, but it was worse than the past. There aren't great services available in general for the, for the needs of somebody with neurodiversity. And... One thing that uh, uh, so one thing that I did initially was I I went and raised did fundraising for autism services. Uh, in that uh, I ha- actually helped a previous employer. I convinced them to establish a national, uh, a nationwide fundraising fr- from their customers, and uh, it was a very good retention play because it was actually uh, part of what the customer spent was donated to uh, the National Autism Charity. That raised half a million, the equivalent of half a million dollars for for the charity, and that led to way more services. And I know half a million dollars is a, a small number in, in a country the size of America. In, in Ireland, you could extrapolate that out to the equivalent of 35 million in the US. So you can imagine the kind of number of children who were given early intervention, etc. As Christopher's become older, uh, I hope I've retained the nicer person. I hope I've been continued to be more aware. But the other thing that I have become is much more aware of, there's limited services for children. There's almost no services for adults. And yet, there's just not an expectation that people should, uh, people with those challenges should work. And to me, the employment level or the unemployment level for people with neurodiversity is way too low. Or sorry, way, the unemployment level is way too high. And actually, when we look past it, it doesn't need to be. So it's it's kind of, it's given me a drive, uh, Chris, in, a, in a, what I hope is a, a more beneficial place, a more socially aware place. So you talked about your... Uh, initial reaction to the diagnosis and that that parents and, and and even employers as you started to talk about can be can be fearful how how do you um, help people think about this issue so one of the things on a personal level is I will uh, spend time as as was done for me people parents who had already been through the process will spend time and talk uh, talk to me about what I needed to do. What I would say for first of all for parents, as I said, it's not a, it's not the kind of limiting factor. It doesn't have to be the limiting factor. There are opportunities. So, but give yourself time. Look after yourself. Look after your partners, uh, because the two parents can take a different approach, etc. But I'll tell a little story about Christopher. So I talked about him being diagnosed at two very low expectations given to us. And as I said, I have had low expectations, you know, 
um, are lower and he constantly exceeds the expectations. And what I realized was, was putting barriers on his own. I wasn't asking him to do as much as he could. Uh, and a lovely thing happened a couple of months ago. Christopher is now 15. His aunt, my sister, has uh, a child in daycare. And Christopher and, and Sam, who's only three, get on so well. Sinead suggested, could uh, Sinead being my sister, uh, suggested to the daycare, could Christopher work there uh, for a work experience? That was so successful a couple of months ago that Christopher's uh, not in school next week because they're, they've got a week off. He's back in the daycare, which is just wonderful. And it's at their request. And the reason I tell that story is because I think the most important message I can give to parents and to employers is to look at the ability and not the disability. Christopher's ability, and my sister saw it better than I did, is with people. He's He's got challenges, he's got a level of intellectual disability, but he is great with people. So you wouldn't think of in the cliched Rain Man or other stereotypes that a person with autism would be great in the service industry or would be great in the education industry. The big thing I would say is, going back to that kaleidoscope image I have, if you've if you've got a hiring need or if you're a parent who sees skills, there's a matching opportunity that we haven't thought of societally that actually is available. And there are more supports, I think, increasingly emerging for parents to tap into that. Um, but there's also more supports for employers to be able to uh, leverage that. You're not on your own either as a parent or as an employer. So at Indeed, our mission is to help people get jobs. This is a, a perfect segue to talking a little bit about what are some of the ideas that you have around what Indeed can do to help more people with neurodiversity get jobs? So the first thing I'll say is um, to continue doing a couple of things. So one is Indeed has uh, has actually established an inclusive culture. It's a, it's a joy for somebody with my background and, and I guess my needs now emotionally, uh, it's fantastic to be working for a company that has that in inclusive culture. Um, and as an example, we all managers do a training on supporting disability and uh, neurodiversity of people with, with those challenges. Um, Indeed has also, and I think this is really important, I want to highlight two employers in, in Ireland, but it'll be relevant to everybody, partnered with a university and an autism charity to create a hiring manager's toolkit for neuro, neurodiversity. And I think those that's what I'm talking about. There are assets that are publicly available that employers can, can access. We probably need to do a better job of highlighting it. We probably need to do a better job of making it, uh, making increased awareness on that side. But this is my, this is my uh, first, first attempt at it, making sure people are aware of it. So I think that's very important. And by partnering with specialist companies, Indeed has been able to do that. I would highlight that any employer can partner with those uh, high, those um, specialist companies to remove some of the barriers. But when we talk about Indeed, what can Indeed do? I would really call out two things. One is to hire pe more people with neurodiversity. And some of that probably requires us to go and look because it's all, not only do employers have a, um, I guess, a mental barrier? Sometimes fear. Some some employers feel, oh, it'll be too hard. It'll be. It's not going to benefit me. It will. There are so many skills they have, but actually, people with neurodiversity have usually, and indeed, their parents, like myself, have usually been brought up or educated not to have expectations of looking for a job, not to think about. That. So I think one of the things that is indeed as a hiring company ourselves can do is see, well, how can we tap into that? So there's, as I say, specialist companies who partner with universities or with other um, communities so that you can, so that those people can be helped to get there. The other, to, to, to go through the hiring process, etc. The other thing that we can do, I mean, indeed, as you say, our, our mission is to help people get jobs and, and, our mission really is to help all people get jobs. So one of the things we can do is to use our platform to, to really to look to change the societal barriers, 
to see how can we as a company help the people uh, help increase the kind of the catchment of people with neurodiversity even making themselves available to the workforce um, and then to highlight to the to employers the opportunities that are available the partners that are available and one thing i would say chris is you know in these um weird times of of uh uh covid etc you know it isn't easy to hire people it isn't easy to fill all the jobs that are available and yet i'm talking gen- a societal generalization here but we've got what 5% of the population who we're not really even thinking about as being potential hires and yet as i say in my kale- kaleidoscope image they all bring different skills and can and therefore can the matching of a whole spectrum of jobs and a whole spectrum of skills that pairing is is i think something that i think it's not going to be easy but indeed certainly can play a role partnering with uh companies who are specialists in that space and giving a bigger platform so for any employers who might be listening what are some of the things that they might be able to do um, better when it comes to hiring for neurodiversity? Yeah, so, uh, well, the first thing I would say is, in in principle, I would want employers to not see this as a corporate social responsibility thing, to see this as finding the right skills, finding people who, uh, who fit the role you're looking for, because they're available, but just think about it in a broader sense. The other thing is... Um, and I keep saying this, but see the ability, not the disability. It's really important on that side. There, I mentioned a couple of specialist companies and I'm a, in my spare time, I'm a non-executive director of a company called Specialist in Ireland. There are many um, equivalent companies across Europe and across uh, the US. Um, there are a number of Specialist in companies, but there are also many equivalent companies. Tend to, they tend to be small, but they have developed frameworks that help companies to successfully um, bring people up into the into the workforce through the hiring process and through the um, actually being in work, the onboarding and being successful in the workplace. And I would encourage employers to seek those out because it seems quite challenging if you don't maybe if you don't initially have a partner or leverage the kind of frameworks we talk about. That indeed put out. Um, so very quick, very quickly, what specialist and will do is they help to identify the client, sorry, the, the essentially clients, the job seekers with neurodiversity. They help the those people to actually go through the interview process. And that can be really scary for, for a young person or even a not so young person with neurodiversity. And then they also help the company. So when there's a successful interview, and it, as we say, it's a it's a regular interview, but when there's a successful interview and a placement, especially Eastern also has a coach available to the company to help train and support managers who are new to this because it it seems, I believe it seems more daunting than it is, but it's very important to have that um, that support and that helps to reduce the barrier. So I think that's something where if employers, particularly the many employers who are struggling to fill their jobs at the moment, the biggest message I would say is you don't have to do it on your own. And there's a whole pool of skills that are available if you take that broader broader viewpoint. So, so you talked about um, different approaches to hiring for neurodiversity, but you also hinted at uh, there's a big difference when someone comes and joins an organization. What are some of the things that employers can do to uh, ensure that they're creating the right support structures for neurodiverse employees? And what should people who are managing uh, teams with neurodiversity be thinking about? Yeah, it's a great question, Chris. I think, and it is, as you say, it's different to just hire. It's how do we make it successful? How do we make it not just successful for the company, which is critical. It should not be a charitable initiative. But it also needs to be successful for the the person. So in terms of um, employers helping managers and managers being aware, creating the the culture 
providing training, providing coaching on that is a is a very important part of that. Um, what I would say, again, of course, I will say I see the ability, uh, not the disability. But one of the things that a company needs to think about, and I'll come back to the managers in a second, is not dissimilar to the neurotypical community. People with neurodiversity have very wide degrees of, of vocalizing where their what their concerns are. And it's important for a manager, uh, sorry, it's important for a manager to check in and to see and to ask questions that may, they may feel like, oh, they tell me, but maybe there's a question about how can you help? And so I'll give an example. I had a, uh, a, a team member who was struggling, who was relatively high stress. And I, I personally, because of my background and my experience, I really try not to fall into the trap of diagnosing everybody with autism. We all, we all have, um, quirks and characteristics, uh, every one of us. But what I did do is I talked with, uh, with the, the person and I said, uh, I, I get shared my observation that really I didn't want a situation where the person was so stressed. And what, after talking, what she said to me was that the stress would build up during the day. And some of it is just being constantly engaged, constantly motion. So we actually gave the opportunity for her to decompress, just take more regular breaks than you might naturally do. And that made an entire difference, not just to her happiness, which was first and foremost, but to her productivity, her impact and her self-worth. And so it's those kind of conversations that a manager needs to create. And then from an employer side, create a safe space. It's okay for people to say, hey, I really need, whether it's the breaks, whether it's um, I need like a darker room or I mean, there's just so many. I need, I need different types of food, et cetera. I need accommodations there. But if while, while things are different, they don't have to be a problem as long as we just see each person has their own sense of style. And I guess the more we've been working from home and doing our hybrid we're all we're all certainly seeing more of each other's individual styles. Well, as we wrap up, um, one of the things that we like to talk about in closing is just looking back over the last fourteen months, which has forced all of us into uh, a different uh, work and and home and family posture. Uh, what has this experience? Um, left you with in terms of looking at things differently and in particular anything that you're feeling optimistic about for the future through this experience? Yes, I think, um, I mean, I, I'll talk about the the kind of the work experience or the opportunities for people uh, when you're in diversity because as I said at the beginning, I've been really lucky. These 14 months personally have, have uh, not been have been boring at times, but not been challenging in, in the ways that have been for so many. For what's happened in the last 14 months in the last, and one of the things that I'm super excited about is that people with neurodiversity have succeeded in adapting. And that's often seen as something that they wouldn't succeed in. They've succeeded in working from home, adapting to the new normal, etc. Another thing that's happened is uh, what I would see is an acceleration of companies embracing the uh, w- wanting to set a target for the proportion of people with neurodiversity and other disabilities that they want to have in the workforce. So as we have leading companies and there's a, um, a group of 500 uh, very large companies who are working together now, um, I think the website is, is called the, the Valuable 500, which is a, an interesting title, but um, it is important because their goal is so focused on create the opportunities. That excites me. One thing I'll say that isn't so exciting is I do see governments, I see it in Ireland, but I see it elsewhere, who the minute a person expresses an interest in working, start to pull away the supports, particularly the financial supports. And so as a society, that we shouldn't let that happen because actually we need to get people, we need to get the culture changed so that get us to a point where 
people with neurodiversity don't need as many supports, but don't pull them straight away. You're essentially pulling the, uh, you know, breaking the bridge that we're trying to build for them. But being involved, you know, and over the last 14 months and even before that, I hope I've expressed just how much I see the kaleidoscope of skills having so much more possibilities than is generally seen. I'm delighted and excited to see that people are, uh, like companies are beginning to see that more and I want to accelerate that. And my hope is, and my next goal, both with Indeed and with Specialist Earn, is to broaden where the, broaden the amount of the spectrum or the kaleidoscope that is targeted and that, that opportunities are given to, because it's still quite niche. It's still data engineers, data scientists, whatever kind of typical um, or stereotypical view you'd have. And actually we have the opportunity, we're beginning to have more and more success stories throughout the whole kaleidoscope of employment. And to me, that's, that's really exciting and really heartening. Well, Peter, thank you so much for sharing your story and your experience. Um, and uh, and your personal journey here. It's, uh, it's really powerful and meaningful. And thank you so much for all the work that you do for the neurodiverse community and, uh, and of course, for indeed helping people get jobs. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity, Chris, uh, in both counts <laughs> and uh, the opportunity to get the platform today. I've been great to have the conversation. As you can tell, I'd keep going for, lo- for plenty longer. So uh, thank you very much.